Welcome to Wednesday Night Bible Study. Can you believe today is June 17th? Man, it's hard to believe that not only the year is going so fast. I mean, this month is just flying by. Well, this evening we encourage you to uh, share this uh, Facebook Bible study on your page this evening and uh, let others see, let others be a part of what what you're doing, what's going on, and I'm going to try to get that done here. Windy and warm today, rain coming up. No, I'm not your weatherman, but that's what they keep telling us is going to take place. We got some great things this evening. We got a couple special music from a couple different people. We've got um, uh, Bible study this evening. We're going to talk about faith. Um, we've got uh, just a great chance to to be together uh, with one another, to fellowship with one another. And so, uh, this evening as we get going, be sure and uh, uh, have your pen and paper, have your Bible, have everything that you need to to go with it. Uh, once we get going in Bible study, <clears throat> and that way you won't have to uh, be disturbed on what you're doing. Uh, you can follow along with this. Uh, we're going to be in Hebrews chapter uh, 11 pretty much the whole uh, evening. And, uh, you know, get your water, get your coffee, whatever it's going to be, get uh, whatever you need, and then we'll uh, gonna go ahead and get started. Uh, so this evening, uh, welcome to June 17th, Wednesday night Bible study. Uh, start telling everybody hello. Uh, Give this time of greeting on there to one another. And uh, I think we have, what do we have first, Jessica? Announcements. We have announcements. Ta -da. All right. So tomorrow is the food pantry from 1 to 4 over at uh, the Lighthouse in Pomona. Uh, we've encouraged the people at North to uh, uh, to give towards uh, canned goods, canned fruits, canned uh, vegetables uh, for this month. <clears throat> and we've got... Uh, several of those coming in, so we, we thank you for those. Uh, we've had people uh, donate towards the food pantry that is even outside of our North Baptist uh, family, and uh, we really appreciate that from you as well. So uh, it's been a great uh, time to be able to share, to meet new families, to, uh, uh, to help in a, a time of need for them as well. So anyway, that'll be going on tomorrow. Uh, Sunday morning again will be... Uh, worship service, 10.30 a.m. It'll be Facebook Live, and it'll be uh, at uh, North Baptist. Wow, in the sanctuary. So if you're coming, be sure and let us know, because uh, we set up each week according to, to who's there and, and who's going to be there. And so uh, we'd appreciate you letting us know that you're going to be there, if you are. <clears throat> if not, be sure and watch it on Facebook Live and share that with your friends as well. All right. Uh, I think that's about all our announcements this evening. I do believe we might have special music. Did you hear Jessica? No, probably not because she's trying to be really quiet. All right, well, Brad Gilgis is going to bring our first selection here this evening. Uh, special music. Let's go.
a great way to start this evening, I think, uh, uh, preparing our heart uh, for the Lord, preparing our heart to serve the Lord and to uh, uh, be about what the Lord has for each one of us. Uh, tonight we're going to talk about uh, living an active faith. And so before we get going in the Bible study this evening, we're going to be in, in Hebrews chapter 11 and uh, the first three verses of chapter 12 when we get there later. But uh, we're going to take a look at, at what an active faith really is really is about. And uh, before we get to that, uh, we've got several on our prayer list that we want to lift up in prayer this evening, and then uh, and then we want to pray for them. So uh, <coughs> we have, uh, uh, want to continue to remember Christy as she recovers uh, with her knee. Uh, um, pray for Darlene, uh, Jerry, and Rex for, for health. Uh, we want to pray for um, the uh, Willie and Linda, and then also Linda with, with her knee as well. Uh, i trying to look down through my list here. We have uh, uh, some recent ones too. Uh, most of you know that uh, uh, Cora had surgery yesterday on her on her knee, or her leg actually, and so is, is recovering. I want to continue to remember her. Uh, really pray for her as she goes through rehab and is strengthened uh, by that, and that uh, you know, the Lord will give her an opportunity to uh, to share uh, her love for the Lord and, and, and the gospel as she's uh, during her rehab time. Um, when I remember Joe and Donna, Joe's um, uh, brother was in a tragic accident on Sunday. And his life was was taken at that point. And uh, so uh, we do want to send condolences to, to Joe and, and Donna and the rest of the family. Uh, we do have many others upon our prayer list that, that we want to continue to remember. Think of uh, Leota as she recovers. Uh, we think of uh, Brad, even as he uh, recovers from his recent uh, uh, surgery that he had. Um, and so there's many others on there. We want to pray for, you know, really our, our country as well. Uh, for the Where we're at, what's going on, uh, the situations at hand, we want to... Uh, Pray for our president, vice president, uh, our leaders of our nation, uh, uh, leaders of our states, our, our local officials, uh, all that's going on. Pray for the um, the police, the, the sheriff's department, the fire departments, uh, all those that uh, uh, protect us throughout the, throughout the week on a daily basis. And uh, even though... If I'm not sure if I'm urgent, but our but our county officials as well. Uh, we want to remember uh, them as they continue to um, help us through this, uh, this COVID-19 that we're working through, and uh, all the families that have lost uh, loved ones in the midst of that, and for those that have uh, continued to uh, uh, contract the virus and are uh, secluded now uh, because of that. And so, with that, this evening, would you uh, would you join me in prayer? You know, Lord, this evening we, we come to you and just uh, with thankful hearts of, of who you are and, and how you provide for us. And, and Lord, you really do uh, not just say that you love us, you express that love in a mighty way. And, and Father, we have so many with, uh, with hurting hearts, with uh, uh, physical ailments, uh, things that uh, uh, can't be maneuvered on a, on a daily basis. So, Father, we ask for your strength to be upon them. 
this evening we think of even Scott and Tanya as well, uh, that you would uh, that you would touch them. And Father, you know each instance of each one of these lives that were mentioned. Father, we pray that you would uh, really heal our land. Uh, but for that to happen, it's going to have to come from our individual hearts of, of repentance, our hearts of uh, reconciliation to you. Until this evening, we ask for your divine intervention in those things, that you would direct us in a way that, that we need to go. And Father, as we, think, as we think this evening by faith, that we would follow you. And so again, this evening, as we open up your word, Lord, we just ask for your hand to be oh, upon yeah. us. And we pray for those elected officials that uh, truly need uh, guidance and direction from you on, on a daily basis because of the things that they face, uh, the things that come about. And so, Father, this evening we, we thank you, we, we love you, and we ask that you speak to us as individuals and, and corporately as well. And, Father, that we will... Uh, Respond to you accordingly with our lives, uh, Father, that we will live faithful, active lives that are ones that bring honor and glory to you. And so we give this time to you this evening, Father. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, as we begin this evening, we are talking about a, an active faith, uh, something that's uh, alive, something that's uh, uh, growing and moving forward, something that's positive. And so that's what... Uh, we're going to talk about this evening. And so having Christian faith means uh, keeping on, keeping on. Uh, we hear that from the Apostle Paul a lot, to, to strive forward, to, uh, to move in advance towards uh, whatever uh, the Lord has for us, and to live faithfully to God, even when life is difficult. You know, it's amazing that uh, this past Sunday's sermon was uh, not about asking that question uh, why is this happening to me, but uh, what can I learn from it? What can the Lord uh, teach us, teach me out of it? And uh, uh, then we have several instances for that to, uh, to take place uh, right in our own, uh, right in our own backyard, in our own church body. And so to, to measure our faith, uh, what, you know, what is faith? Uh, and we're going to see that this evening from Hebrews chapter 11. And so as we begin this evening, I got a couple questions for you as we as we start about this. Um, what is faith, and how do we live out our faith? How do we live a, a an active faith life? And so that's what we're going to answer this evening, hopefully, as we as we guide you through this uh, Hebrews chapter eleven. And so faith really is a, a God given uh, capacity. Uh, uh, an enablement from God to allow us to understand that God really does exist. God will keep his promises, and he enables us to live faithfully to him, and he gives us strength even when at times in our lives we think that he's not even there. When we face those difficulties, whatever that difficulty might be for you today, uh, as we've got uh, several on this evening as they've shared that on their page, or we encourage you to share it on your page, or it'll come in contact with others that, that have difficulties going on with their lives today, whether it be physical, whether it be financial, whether it be emotional, um, whether it be a, a spiritual battle. Uh, there are difficulties that go on in our lives. And so a, as we look to this now, you know, what faith is, is a, is a time where it enables us to draw on the Lord's strength, especially uh, when we face difficulties. And so this letter to the Hebrews, uh, it teaches that, that faith enables us to be certain that, that God is true and that God is the promise keeper. Uh, he keeps his promises. Uh, uh, we're convinced of things that we can't see. And so this evening, it, it, you know, it's it's a pleasure uh, to be able to, uh, to be with you in Bible study, but to talk about things that we can't see and have a hard time understanding is what we're going to try to bring some understanding to this evening. And so faith is something that you can't see 
with the human eye. You know, we can see a lot of things. We can see a lot of colors, you know, as long as you're enabled to do that. Um, there's lots of things that, that take place in all of that. But faith, you, you just can't really see. And so this book of Hebrews, I mean, this letter to the Hebrews really declares that faith is the assurance of things hoped for. And faith convinces us that God is, is true to his promises and that it is certain and secure. And so if we move on now to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, that's exactly what the writer to Hebrews says. Faith is the confidence of what we hope for and the assurance about what we do not see. What we don't understand, what we don't comprehend, yet faith is there. And so faith goes beyond just believing. You know, that's how we uh, accept the Lord. That's how we come to salvation is through faith by grace alone in Jesus Christ. It's, it's by faith. But yet, Faith is more than just believing. Faith is doing. Faith is putting <coughs> our belief of Jesus Christ into action in our lives today. And it, it uh, our faith, in essence, shows exactly what we believe about God. How deep we go with our relationship, how deep we... Uh, are in uh, our spiritual walk all shows by how we live that out. And so God's promises then, it empowers believers to understand who God is, what he wants, and what he's doing. And so faith is not only uh, believing, faith is not only, only doing, but faith is growing. And so our faith should continue to grow even as we face these difficulties in life that, that come our way. And those things are when we, when we face these difficulties, we, we trust the Lord that he knows what's best for us at the time. And uh, as we realize our weaknesses, our lack of strength, and yet the power that's in God's hands to lead us on. And so how do, how do Christians continue to serve and live for God when, when trouble comes, when persecution comes, when difficulties come, when problems arise? And so this answer, uh, the answer to that question is found in Hebrews chapter 11. That, that's where we find it. And so the writer of Hebrews, he wanted to encourage all of those that, that read the letter uh, to the Hebrews to remain true to Christ and to resist the pull to go back to where we were before. To turn around and go back. But to remain faithful in the Christian walk. And so he, he made this plea by pointing to the fact of, of Jesus' superiority to the prophets, to all the other foreign gods, and that he is the only one true God that then can provide this certain hope for us. He was superior to Moses. He was superior to uh, Melchizedek. Uh, all those things, he was more powerful, had more control, and had opportunities to live a lifestyle that then would teach us how to live. And so that writer of the Hebrews illustrates that that the, the counts of all those by faith who, who live faithfully, even in difficulties and persecution, uh, can rise above those problems. He calls us to, a, to an action of faith, to living our faith and being an active participant in a relationship with Jesus. It assures us of the truth about the gospel message, the good news of Jesus Christ. It empowers us to faithful conduct, and it comforts us and strengthens us when we face trials. And so the thing is that just because we've accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior doesn't mean that things are not going to happen. It means that 
if we've accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior, then no longer do we have to depend upon our own faith, our own strength, our own selves when those things come about. And so in Hebrews, I'm going to bounce back a little bit to Hebrews chapter 10, and I'm going to read 35 to 39 as we uh, begin this evening. Hebrews 10, 35 to 39. So do not throw away your confidence. It'll be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you'll receive what he has promised. For in just a little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. But the righteous one will live by faith. And if he shrinks back, I will not be pleased with him. But we who are not of those who shrink back are destroyed, but those who believe and are saved. And so it assures us then that there are times where difficulties will come and we will in <clears throat> turn want to turn back, shrink back to the life we had before. But the writer says to persevere through those things. Don't let those things get us sidetracked. Don't let those things get us upset or, or moving in a direction that would be a direction that, that we don't need to go. Or a direction that would lead us away from what God has in store for us. And so then that starts us off this evening with Hebrews chapter 11 verses 1 and 2. Now, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. Okay, so that's where we begin this evening. That word faith in these verses, does it, uh, it doesn't just mean believing in God, but it's an active uh, relationship. It's an active life that these people had lived. It moves, it molds the conduct of the believers as they come in, in into these uh, persecutions, into these problems, into these troubles that they face. And this faith then assures believers that God's promises of hope are real and that they're valid and that they come true when we continue to follow him. And so in Hebrews, really, there's a, a, an unbreakable bond between faith and and hope. It's a certain hope that we have that God will provide the way out, provide the necessities, provide the things that need to come. And so, so many times we try to do all of those things in our own power. You know, when we um, become financially strapped, instead of trusting the Lord, we try to work two jobs, work three jobs, work extra time so that we can provide for ourselves when really the Lord is just saying, you know, cut back, relax, trust in him. And that's what we see, the promised blessings of God. And so the word translated assurance in verse 1, it holds a deep meaning. The word describes a faith that gives us a substance that provides confidence. So it's something that we can really then believe in. And so faith is the, the foundation on which we build our relationship with God. Our faith is raised and grows when those problems, when the troubles arise. And another thing about it is that some of the ancient writings use the term to refer to a document that provides evidence of ownership and assurance. And so that faith can be seen as a guarantee. It provides ownership from God in our lives. And so we're giving over to him. We're giving him ownership of our lives and allowing him to live out his purpose and plan in our lives. Is it difficult? Yeah. Is it a growing process? Yes. But are you blessed because of it? Oh, immensely. And so that's the point. So assurance then is, is confidence. It's the most uh, satisfactory feeling that you will ever feel. 
when you begin to trust him. And so faith is, is not just a commonplace thing. It's not just an emotion that we have one time. But our faith continues to grow. It's something that's alive. It's something that's active. It's something that, that drives believers to reach out and grasp those realities that God has. And so, unfortunately, most of the time, when problems arise, when trouble comes, when persecution raises its head, the first thing we do is to turn away from God because like in the message Sunday morning, why is this happening to me? Why does it have to happen? I'm a believer. I've been following the Lord. He should be blessing me. And all along he's saying, trust me in these things. Let me lead and guide you through this. And so faith then is a conviction that creation came into being by God. And if we look at verse 3, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3, by faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command. So that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. It wasn't there before, but God breathed life into it and said, let it be. And then when it was, he said, it is good. And so the very first thing in our faith, we have to come to the point of believing that God is, that God exists, and that God is the creator of all. And so as we look in this evening to see these patriarchs, you'll see that each one of them did just that. They believed God. And that's how they were convicted to live a life that followed him. And so believers are to please God on the basis of their faith in him. When we trust God and we see him provide, we trust God even more. When we turn to ourselves and try to provide those things for ourselves that we don't think that God can provide, that maybe he needs us to help with, then we don't turn to him in those ways. And so we need to learn to trust God. You know, when you're, when you're a little child and you learn to walk, uh, it, it's one of the greatest things, I think, uh, greatest examples, because they'll get up and they'll fall. But instead of staying down, they just get right back up. They don't know not to get back up and go. And when they first start, they really only do take one or two steps. And then they fall. And then they go back to the starting point. They climb back up against something, and they'll take one or two steps. And they may not get any farther than they did the first time, and they fall. But they continue, and they continue to persevere. They continue to strive forward. And then the next time, it's four steps, six steps, maybe eight or ten. And before you know it, then they're walking. They're not walking with great stability. You know, they're walking like those weebles wobbles, right? But they don't fall down. And then before you know it, they begin to run. Oh, but as they run, they're awkward, right? And they fall face first into the concrete and your face is all scuffed up. But it doesn't stop them after a little bit of crying, after a little bit of tears, after a little bit of hugs from mom or dad or, or grandpa or grandma, they're up and they're at it again. And so that's the way it should be with our Christian walk with God. That we continue to strive forward and grow in our relationship with him because we trust him that he knows what's better. And so on the basis, basis of their faith, Abel and Enoch and Noah, they please God because they're their faith in him allowed them to perform things that they could never do on their own. The actions that they have become well known for. Enoch walked with God, then he was no more. Noah built an ark before it had ever rained. People ridiculed him. It took forever to build this thing. It wasn't like they had it built overnight. All those things took place. Now in verse 4 through 7, it explains that. By faith, Abel offered God a better sacrifice than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as a righteous man when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, he still speaks even though he's dead. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. 
he could be found, he could not be found, because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as the one who pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. And before we go on to verse 7, we've got to stop and evaluate that verse 6. We've got to see that what that says is that it's impossible to please God without faith. And then if we come to him, we must acknowledge that God exists and that he is the creator. He is the one. And that is the, as we do that, then he rewards those who seek him. Move on to verse 7. It says, By faith Noah, when warned about many things not yet seen, in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. By faith, by his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of righteousness that comes by faith. It hadn't even rained. God told him to build an ark. Not just a little boat to float down the stream, but one that could hold all the animals that needed to be in there. He could even hold the people that would come, even though only Noah's family did. He was condemned. He was ridiculed. But by it, he was accounted righteous. So verse Six, it really tells us that we can't please God apart from our faith. And that's true because the one who seeks God, the one who approaches God, the one who goes after God, must believe that not only does God exist, you know, that's, that's pretty important in itself, right? That God exists. But also that God rewards those that diligently seek him. And so faith believes that God exists and that God will keep his promises. And so this conviction then that's upon our heart that God exists, and that he keeps his promises, it enables believers then to, to live faithfully in all circumstances. That means even when trouble comes our way, even when persecution raises his head, even when circumstances are out of control in our lives. And so the author of Hebrew really points to, to faith as the as the act of faith that lived out in the lives of people like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and Moses and Elijah and Elisha and, and Jeremiah and others. It, it ain't when those heroes of faith to follow God's will for proper living, even when it didn't seem natural. Even when by the human world standards it couldn't take place, they followed God and God moved in their lives. So faith enabled Abraham to live or to leave Chaldea for a promised land, a promised inheritance that God hadn't even shown him, but yet he said, was there. To pack up everything and just leave and to go to where God wanted him to be. And he lived in tents along the way. Verse 9. <clears throat> By faith he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents. As did Isaac and Jacob who were heirs of him of the same promise. They lived. They looked forward to the city that foundations whose architect was the builder who is God. We see that in verse 10. He's looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. Looking forward to something far better and greater than what we have here. Now, if you look around our country today, you know, what once was great seems to be in shambles and chaos. And I, I almost believe that God allows that to take place because we're not supposed to have our 
our cinch is in. We're not supposed to be grasped in this life that we live today. We're supposed to be sojourners in this land. Foreigners because our home is heaven and we're just a passing through. And one day, soon, I really believe, Jesus is going to come for his church. And we're to be prepared. And we're to be ready. And we're to be ready for his approach, his appearance. And not so tied to this world that we can't leave. You know, we talked about that with the many of the Israelites from, from Judah when they were held captive in, in uh, Babylon. Once they were released, they just stayed because they were so comfortable where they were, they didn't want to go back home. Is that going to be us? It shouldn't be. Verse 11 and verse 12. By faith, Abraham, even though he was past age and Sarah herself was barren, was enabled to become the father, a father, because he considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man, as he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. Abraham and Sarah, as good as dead, old, barren, had never had kids, and God said, you will, because I am. And they did. And they believed the promise, even though it was hard for them to understand as well. Abraham was old. Sarah was old. They were barren. They hadn't had a child. But yet, through Abraham and Sarah, the descendants would be as numerous as the stars in the sky. And if you've ever went out at night without all the city lights and you look up, the stars are just illuminating from everywhere. If you ever went by the seashore, one of the lake shores, and you look at all the sand that's there and Think, can you imagine stopping and counting all the grains of sand? And yet it says that Abraham's descendants are as numerous as them. All those heroes of faith back then in the Old Testament died still looking forward to the final promise that they believed. Faith allowed them to view an unfulfilled promise that we see. And so God's promise was in their hearts. It was in their minds. And they were living it out. It wasn't just something that they left home and, and, and went to the temple on Sunday to worship God with. Verse 13 and 14. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. And they admitted that they were aliens and strangers in this land. You know, a couple different times we've uh, been to Michigan, uh, either in the UP or over on the Detroit side and uh, Oscoda area even. And you look across the, uh, the lakes and you can see the land on the other side and that's Canada. You're not there, but it's just at a distance. And, and sometimes the the haze or the fog on the lake doesn't allow you to see what's over there. But it's still there. And some days it's crystal clear and it, it looks like it's just right there that, boy, if you jumped in a kayak, you could just paddle out to it. But believe me, the distance is way farther than that. And so that's what they were saying. It was, it was beyond their comprehension, but they knew because they trusted God God existed, God was the creator, God said that it would happen, and so they believed it. And even though they died before it happened, they, they knew, they trusted God by faith, that it would someday happen. And we've seen that fulfillment, and so it should be powerful in our lives today. 
15 and 16. If they had been thinking of the country they left, they would have <clears throat> excuse me, had the opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. If they'd been thinking about what they had left, they would have turned around and went back. And so many times, that's what we do. Trouble comes in the way, and all of a sudden, it, it distorts our view like fog. And we can't see. And their first thought is, I just want to turn around and go back. I want to go back to where I can see. I want to go back to where I think I can understand. And that's what we do. We run from the direction. Instead of heading forward, we return to where we shouldn't even have been in the first place. And that's the mistake. But these people didn't do that. They went ahead. They went forward. And so God was not ashamed to be called their God. And then in 17 through 19, by faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He would receive the promises about the sacrifice, was about to sacrifice his one and only son. Even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offering, offspring will be reckoned, Abraham reasoned that God would somehow raise the dead and figuratively speaking, he did receive Isaac back from the dead. That trial required more than trust for Abraham. It revealed that he had a solid rock faith. That was a severe trial that he went through. God had told Abraham that it was through Isaac that this was going to take place, that, that his, his offspring would be as numerous as the stars in the sky or the sands in the sea, and yet here God's saying, sacrifice your son, your one and only son, the one that I said the promise would be through. And Abraham trusted God so much that he believed that if Isaac died, he would raise him from the dead and utilize it in a positive way. And so no matter what he did, he was going to receive, he was going to give Isaac, yet receive him back. And so 20 through 22. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau in regard to their future. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons and worshipped as he leaned on top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, when his end was near, spoke about the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt and gave instructions about his bones. Isaac's faith in blessing Jacob and Esau. Jacob's faith in blessing the sons of Joseph. Joseph's faith in mentioning that the exodus that was coming from Egypt enabled them to believe God's promise for the future. That even though they were exiled, even though they were in oppression to the Egyptians, they knew that God was going to somehow, at some point, deliver them from that. In verse 23, by faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born, because they saw that he was no ordinary child. And they were not afraid of this king's edict. Another person of faith steps up, Moses, whose parents hid him for three months. They had to overcome fear to defy the Pharaoh. And it was through that faith then that Later on, the people would be delivered. 24 through 26. By faith, when he had grown up, by faith Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of the Pharaoh's daughter. 
He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. He regarded this grace for the sake of Christ as a greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking forward to his reward. He was looking ahead to that reward to defy what the Pharaoh had to say, the parents. And now these verses detail how Moses, as he grew in maturity, gave up the life of the Egyptians gave up this positive life that he had and joined the difficulties and he joined the problems and he joined the troubles that come along with living in oppression, living with an afflicted people. And Moses, he considered by faith the abuse and the suffering with God's people was, was more advantageous than it was to be considered the Pharaoh's son or the Pharaoh's daughter. And though the author of Hebrews emphasizes the fact that obedience to God doesn't eliminate suffering. Obedience to God is willfully and joyfully following him even in the face of of trouble, even in the face of problems. Because there's a reward ahead that comes from the glory of God. And so Moses journeyed from Egypt, followed that promise of faith in 27 and 28. By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible his faith in God. By faith he kept the Passover, the sprinkling of blood, so that the destroyer of the firstborns would not touch the firstborn of Israel. Moses didn't fear the anger of the Pharaoh, even though he knew that it would come. He looked to God, he trusted God, and he followed God. He persevered because his faith was in God it enabled him to keep the Passover the sprinkling of blood the trusting that God was going to pass over all of those that had the blood of the lamb on the doorpost tops and the sides and we can see now that that's such a great picture of the death of Christ and faith enabled Moses and the people to, to trust in the blood and to the safety of their firstborn. So we see that each one of these Old Testament patriarchs, they trusted God. And their faith led them forward. And so that faith that Moses had also, it led the people to leave Egypt and pass through the Red Sea. In verse 29, the path through the Red Sea is on dry land, but when the Egyptians tried to do so, they were drowned. The crossing of the Red Sea was a miraculous event for the Israelites. It was a tragedy for the Egyptians. And so faith enables then Christians to attempt the impossible and allow God to accomplish it. The author of Hebrews it really builds up this fact of faith is, is really the entry into the promised land. You, know, you, you think back to verse 1, talks about uh, faith is believing in what we're not seeing. And going on to say, there as we pass 28, that he said, what more shall I say indicates that we trust God even more. 
So triumphant faith means that we trust God to live even in a time where adversity comes in our lives. We're going to trust God in the face of every kind of opposition, every kind of turmoil. And so the list of names that we went through this evening mentions that just a few of them who really deserve to be mentioned, but it showed how each one, faith is what enabled them to do what they did. As you look and close out through the, the book of Hebrews there, you see different ones who were mentioned, different ones that were talked about. And all of those had faith as their response. In verses 35 through 38, Closing out chapter 11 almost there. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured and refused to being released. They might gain a better resurrection. Some faced years of flogging, while still others were chained and put in prison. When they were stoned, they saw, they saw it in two. They were put to death by sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and in holes in the ground. A lot of them endured persecution because of their faith. A lot of them had their lives taken from them because of their faith. But it didn't stop them because they looked ahead to the promise of what God had told them would be. They were commended for their faith. These faithful men and women didn't stop during their earthly pilgrimage, their earthly living and active faith to turn around and go back to where they were before. But they looked ahead to the fulfillment of God's promises in the coming of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Now these faithful people were by no means stopped or alienated from joy in their lives because they had that. They looked forward to the master plan which God would lead and God would direct them. In verses 39 to 40, it says, These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised, because it hadn't happened yet. God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. And so the author of Hebrews, he enables us to see this lesson stems from faith. And those who had faith trusted him, even though it had not even taken place yet, and yet their lives, they died before it happened. But yet they believed. And so we move on over to chapter 12. Verse 1 says, therefore. Was it therefore? It's therefore all the things that we just mentioned in chapter 11. All the patriarchs that were there, all the things that they had believed, all the things that they had trusted God because they believed that he existed and that he was the creator of everything. And so therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders us and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. This illustrates what faith is to be about. That we're to live an active faith that it's not supposed to just stop when we believe in Jesus Christ, but it allows us to continue to move forward because that's what it's about. It's about growing in him. It's about following him. It's about living a better life because we're looking forward to not living here forever, but we're looking forward to heaven and being with Jesus and all of the believers together. The author here uses that athletic contest uh, imagery. They were surrounded by spectators. You can imagine being in a big coliseum. Well, maybe not now because we have to social distance. But 
before this, you can imagine being surrounded by spectators who urged them on and, and motivated them to go forward, to reach that goal. And so that great cloud of witnesses gives us a valid reason for striving forward. It puts those actions together. As believers, even you and I, we need to regain what we have lost. It encourages us to lay aside everything that entangles us. Every weight, every sin, everything that causes us to stumble in our relationship with the Lord. And he says to strip those off and, and throw those aside. Anything that hinders in your life a full service to Jesus Christ. You're supposed to put that aside. Anything that would encumber your service, anything that would encumber your performance. Christians are supposed to rid themselves of all of that, especially sin, so that our service to the Lord is perfect in the direction we need to go. Shut those off, those things aside. Chapter 12, verse 2. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus was totally in. And he was totally in for you and for me. And everything else was pushed aside because he knew what needed to be done. And what he's asking of you and I is to put aside those things that make us stumble. Put aside those things that allow us to stumble. Put aside those things that get in the way of our relationship with him. Jesus is the pioneer. He's the perfecter of our faith. And by those actions, he endured the cross because he knew this was not going to stop him, that he had a future. And so that's what we need to know. These things that come in our way, these trials, these persecutions, these whatever it is, all these things that come our way, these troubles, they're not us. And they're not stopping us because we're moving forward and we have a home in heaven because of what we believe in God. And so Jesus said it's to be the source and the goal of our faith. It's in him that our faith depends on and it's in him our faith rests. And then verse 3, chapter 12. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. And boy, is that true or what? Because as soon as those troubles come, as soon as persecution comes, as soon as we face these things that, that's out of our control, the first thing we want to do is turn around and go back. Go back to what we know. Go back to something that we can control instead of striving forward. But Jesus' actions on the cross, it, it climaxes at that point because he took our place so that he could give us a right standing with God. The motive for the cross for Jesus Christ was our, yours and mine, salvation. And that was the joy that was set before him. He was going to complete that work of salvation that he had come to perform for the Father. And so we need to consider Jesus. We need to consider him who endured so that we may not grow weary and lose heart. And so to, to wrap all this up this evening in, in this Hebrews 
uh, chapter 11, beginning of verse 12 here. We see that the world offers us a lot of things. And most all the things the world offers us is something to trip us up, to make us stumble, to make us falter, to make us as we move forward with God want to go back because we can remember this. Remember that. Remember when it was like this. And so many times we want to give up when the struggle comes. Because we think if we give up, that it would just relieve our struggle. But the writer of Hebrews stressed that giving up doesn't relieve the struggle. The struggle is still there. Giving up relieves the point of following Jesus. We've stepped aside. We've stepped along a different path. We've stepped along a different journey than where we need to be. And so not only do we need to look back at those patriarchs of the Bible that were mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11, we need to look at Jesus. Look at Jesus' life. Look at his sacrifice. Look at his commitment to you and I. I am so thankful that Jesus didn't say, oh, this journey for me is just too hard. Kim's just going to have to die for his own sins. Because that's what I would have to do, is die. And he didn't. He knew how simple I was before 2,000 years ago. He knew how simple I was going to be. And yet he, he strove forward to the cross and he endured the pain and the suffering and the shame so that little old me could have eternal life with him in heaven. And so Jesus' life shows us endurance. Even in the face of danger, even in the face of pain and suffering and sorrow. And his atoning work is that for us, we should not grow weary. We should not lose heart. And we should not become faint because troubles and persecutions come in our life today. We should follow like Jesus. The call for a faithful, living, active life in the face of everything is to push Satan aside and say, it don't matter what you throw. It don't matter what you put in front of me. I'm following God because this ain't my home. I'm just a passing through. And I'm trying to take everybody I can with me as I go. Christians at every age have been tempted to compromise and to turn away from the Lord. And this letter to the Hebrews this evening shows us that we should remain steadfast. I can guarantee you tomorrow's headlines in a newspaper are going to be bad. And Friday's is going to be bad, and Saturday's is going to be bad, and Sunday's going to be bad, and until Jesus comes, things are going to be bad. And they're going to get worse. And if we're going to turn away just because of obstacles that come in our lives today. There's no way that we can face real persecution. And the reason is we're facing the wrong things. We're looking at self instead of glory. And so as we keep our eyes on Christ, we conform to his example and his standards, we continue to live and serve him faithfully. So this letter this evening tells us to believe God that he exists. We're supposed to believe God that he is the creator. We're to look at these patriarchs of the past and see how they endured <coughs> persecution and turmoil and trouble and sorrow and pain and testing so that they can follow God. And we're to put aside everything else and we're to strive to be more Christ-like. And when the temptation really gets hard, we're to look at Jesus and remember what he's done for you and for me. And so as we close out this evening, we have some questions for you. I want to find things that will help you when trouble comes. 
The first thing is remember those who have lived by faith. That's those ones in Hebrews chapter 11. That we should go back and read those and ponder on their lives and their thoughts and what has happened in their lives and how that relates to us today. The second thing that hinders us from living a Christian life and serving Jesus. And there's a bunch of them. And so we'll have to start number them and get them to that point so that we can figure out what they are. And we're to give them up. And then we're to continue with determination to live the life God has called you to. You and me. And we're going to be determined to live that life no matter what comes in the way. Pain, sorrow, death, turmoil, chaos. It's going to happen. But our focus is to be on him. Or to live a life of selfless service following Christ as our example. That's kind of the chapter 12 there. Looking at Jesus. See what he did for us. See what he expects for us to do for him. And then to accept God's help in remaining faithful. Trust God. When the problem comes, trust God. When the turmoil comes, trust God. I'll post these five things that we've got here this evening on Facebook after we close out here this evening. So if you can't get those down, I encourage you to write them down. But don't just write this stuff down. This is about putting it into practice in our lives. And so that'll bring us to our questions this evening. Yes? Yes, sir. What helps you to remember how faithful God is to you? There's got to be something that brings that to mind in your life. And the next thing I want you to think about is what would you say to an unbeliever about why you try to live the Christian life? Why do you want to put aside those sinful activities in your life so that you can live a better life with Jesus as you close out whatever time you have left on this earth? Think about those questions today. As we go this evening, we've got, uh, we're going to close with a song by Tanya. And so Tanya brings a very good one this evening. So I want you to pause from whatever you're doing and listen to the words of this song. Savior is waiting to enter your heart. Why don't you let him come in? There's nothing in this world to keep you apart. What is your answer to him? Time after time, he has waited before, and now he is waiting again to see. tonight he, he's knocking on the door of your heart and he wants to know are you willing to accept that God exists and that God is the creator of all and that he sent his son Jesus Christ into this world so that you could have life if you turn from yourself and your sinful ways repent of that acknowledging that there's no way that we can have it without him and he's got it and he's already provided it. and all we have to do is accept the gift and open it up into our lives of what God has for us. It's interesting this evening, I want to share this with you. Uh, Brad, who sang and played your first song for you, has 
some health struggles. He'd had recent surgery, their, uh, everything went well, but uh, it's not like his life is a perfect life. He, he has health things too, just like all the rest of us. Tanya this evening, as she brings this song, the Savior is waiting for you. Struggles with some health concerns too. We pray for her. We pray for Scott, her husband, who has, has some back things going on. And so, uh, and, and Brad with his wife, uh, Linda, has had some uh, health concerns as well. So they face those things, but yet they strive forward. Are they perfect? No, none of us are. But we strive forward to that. And so it was great to have encouragement from them, but we should encourage them in what they're doing. Hey, you guys did a great job in encouraging us. Keep, keep going forward. Keep striving. Keep fixing your eyes on Jesus because he's the one. And so that's where we'll close out this evening. Uh, I encourage you to help uh, continue to contribute towards the, the ministries that we provide. We have several uh, missionaries that we provide for, uh, ministry uh, outlets that we provide for. And, and during this time of COVID, it, it's, it's difficult because um, uh, wherever you're at around the world, uh, giving is, is down. And so we encourage you to, to give so that those ministries can continue to be fulfilled. You can give through the Generosity of Lifeway app or you can give directly to... Uh, uh, donate to North Baptist uh, by a check at, at Post Office Box 117, Ottawa, Kansas, 66067, uh, Linda Gilgis. Uh, she'll get that and, and uh, file it where it needs to go. And so this evening, it's really all about you, what you do with what you got. And so I, I want to encourage you this evening to be encouraged. I want to encourage you this evening to trust Jesus. Either trust him for the first time or trust him in your life with what you're doing. Don't try to provide everything for yourself unless Jesus is telling you to, which I really doubt that he is. He's asking you to trust him, to trust God, to allow those things to take place, and to let him move forward. Hey, we'll see you. Sunday morning at 10.30, either in the sanctuary at North Baptist. Again, let us know if you're coming so we can uh, make arrangements for you. Or Facebook Live. Be on there. Be ready. Share this on the page so others can hear it. It's about living an active faith. It's not just about having a sideline faith. It's about living an active faith. Well, we're about ready to close. Be sure and tell everybody on here goodbye. We'll see you later. We're looking forward to seeing you Sunday. It was great to see all of you. Um, Facebook Live, seeing you. Um, I love ministering with you, sharing things with you, uh, being a part of Bible study with you. And so it's great this evening, wherever you're listening from or in the days to come, we encourage you to live an active faith. And hey, if you need something in the meantime, be sure and get a hold of me and be glad to help in whatever you do. So with that this evening, we will see you Sunday.